Hey, hello. How are you, my weird friends? Welcome to Pocket Full of Crime, a true crime podcast hosted by yours truly. If you are new, welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Rachel, and I hope you decide to join my weird friends and hit that subscribe button and turn on your notification bell so you can be alerted when I post any new episodes. Don't forget to go follow my Pocket Full of Crime Instagram and Facebook page where I post additional content and photos of each case so you can put a face to the crime. First line of business, this episode is sponsored by Prismatic Images Photography. And Rob was so generous to send me this microphone sound shield that has helped me cut down on editing time and background noise. So I wanted to give him a big shout out and go follow his Facebook and Instagram pages. He is a local photographer in the Nebraska area now. And if you go check out his Instagram, you just might find some images of yours truly. I have been missing you guys so much. I am about 30 so days of school left and five weeks of an externship and I will be done and hopefully crossing my fingers be able to commit more time to my weird friends that I miss oh so much and thank you guys for all my loyal subscribers who have stuck around. I appreciate you guys more than you know. I have also been working a little bit behind the scenes on starting a YouTube channel um, as well as following up on some cases that I will be doing in the near future. The case today I have, um, I've had on my list for a while of recommendations, but with some new development and buzz around the topic, I thought now couldn't be a better time to bring awareness to the case. There have been arrests made recently, but still no answers or a body recovered. So this fight is far from over. You were listening to Dig Up the Backyard. The disappearance of Cal Poly student, Kristen Smart. in reverse. Traveling back to the year 1996, which seems to be the year when a lot of infamous crimes took place. And just a side note, I was only three years old. In 1996, Bill Clinton had been re-elected president, Pokemon was released, Red Bull entered the U.S. market, Minimum wage was $4.75 per hour, and this is the same year Jean Benet Ramsey and Tupac were murdered. The crime we are discussing today takes place in San Luis Obispo, California. 
located on Southern California's central coast. Population for the year of 2021 is estimated at 271,172, which has actually dropped 2% since 2020, where population was at 276,818. San Luis Obispo is a little bit difficult to say and has earned the nickname Slow. S L O. While I researched the area, I took heavy notes on all the wineries in the area. It's also home to the Bubblegum Alley, which is a 15 foot high, 70 foot long alley lined with used chewing gum from years of tourists. San Luis Obispo is also home to California Polytechnic State University, but more well known as Cal Poly. This public university offers 65 bachelor's and 39 master's degrees, with academics focused on combining technical and professional curriculum with the arts and humanities. Our crime takes place right here on Cal Poly campus over Memorial Day weekend, May 24th, 1996. Let me introduce you to Kristen Smart. I can't emphasize how strikingly beautiful this young lady was. She was born February 20th, 1977. To the proud parents, Stian and Denise Smart in Augsburg, Germany. Both of her parents were teachers and were teaching military personnel. Kristen was the eldest of three. She had a younger brother and sister. As a young child, her family migrated from Germany to Stockton, California, where she graduated from Lincoln High School in 1995. She was a beautiful, wild spirit with dirty blonde hair, brown eyes, and very tall for other girls her age. She was estimated to be a six foot one. She was enrolled at Cal Poly in 1996 just 245 miles from her parents' home, but far enough for some freedom. She had dreams of being an architect and traveling the world. She was a very outgoing personality, bubbly, and made friends very easily. So I want to make kind of a side note commentary here. We're talking about 1996 where cell phones probably existed, but maybe like the ones in limousines or, or just like huge dinosaurs you carried around in your pocket. So this was in the year where they used landlines. Now, a lot of my younger subscribers, you need to probably Google what that is. Like a phone hooked up to an actual cord, Google it. It was once a thing. I had one. I had to literally pull it like around the corner as far as it would reach for like a little bit of privacy in like the sixth grade. Anywho, on campus in their dormitories at Cal Poly, they all were assigned a landline and it would keep track of the incoming outgoing calls and On this weekend, Memorial Day weekend, Kristen had made a phone call to her parents and had got their voicemail. They missed her call. They were out. And the voicemail referred to she had good news and that she would call them on Sunday. Now, this is before text messaging was a thing and you actually had to plan your phone calls prior to them taking place. So they were expecting a phone call on Sunday and they never got one. But let me back up to Friday leading up to her disappearance. Memorial Day weekend, 1996. A lot of students left campus to visit family over the long weekend but Kristen Smart was one of the students who didn't. May 24th, 1996 was a Friday night. 
she was determined to go out to find a party and have some fun. Kristen's roommate, Crystal, had left for the weekend, so Kristen finds her close friend, Margarita Compos, in the same dorm and begins to beg her to go out and find a party. Now, I'm sorry, but mom and dad, why the fuck didn't you name me Margarita? Like, my personality is Margarita or Moscato. Is it too late to change my name? Asking for a friend. Now, Margarita was opposite of Kristen. She knew that she had finals coming up and homework to do and was very skeptical about going out. But Kristen was not about to give in. The two joined another group of girls and headed to a party off campus. But for lack of better words, the party was a dud and not what Kristen had in mind. Now, there isn't much background history about Kristen and her previous behavior, whether she was a frequent off-campus partygoer, on-campus partygoer, whether she was the type to even go out at all. But this weekend in particular, she was determined to find a party. So this doesn't seem like somebody who was a frequent party goer if she was that desperate to find somewhere to be this weekend. But either way, the way that this case was framed around the fact that she had gone out and acted like every other college student I know, um, was very detrimental to this case. The girls had flagged down a male friend driving a pickup and got in to find another party. However, the campus was dead quiet. After driving around with no luck, Margarita wanted to head back to the dorms. Kristen begged her to walk one more block. The two were in a parking lot on campus in almost a begging match of who would give in. But this time, Margarita didn't want to give in. She wanted to go back to the dorm. But what she did do was give Kristen the key to the dormitory, which Kristen did not have. Margarita knew the doors would be open by the time she made it back to her dorm. But Kristen would be locked out if she stayed out much later. The two parted ways, and Margarita watched her friend's shadow fade into the night, not knowing that this would be the last time she ever heard, spoke, or seen her friend Kristen again. Now, speaking from 2021, and looking back at 1996, where I was literally only three years old, the types of situations that happened in 1996 were probably slim to none compared to the things that we have to be aware of in 2021. So I don't blame Margarita. I think that it was a very noble thing of her to do and responsible thing of her to do to leave her with a key to at least get back into the dormitory. Now, these two weren't dorm roommates, but they did live in the same dorm building. So, I can't imagine the guilt that Margarita lives with today. And not that she deserves that at all, but as a friend, and that being the last time that you seen her, I can't imagine... The feelings that just naturally flow with not knowing what would have happened if she just would have walked that one extra block or just stayed with her and taken her back to the door. Kristen was wearing a gray crop top, black vinyl shorts, which are pretty much biker shorts. 
and red puma shoes. Now, she did not have any money, credit cards, or an ID on her at the last time that she was seen. And she was 19 years old. So, being without these items, I don't think that she was planning to not return anytime soon. Kristen had kept walking and found exactly what she was looking for at 135 Crandall Way, the Akapakai Fraternity House, which has its own terrible reputation. The party was a birthday party a celebration for a man named Brian Fell, but went by Swampy. Cute. So cute. At this party, Kristen was going by the name Roxy, spelled just the way you would think it would be, R-O-X-I-E, which is one of the many aliases that she would make up when she was being social. It was just kind of like a personality thing with her. She liked to be somebody else. Now, Kristen was not drunk or even drinking when she was last seen by Margarita Compos at 10 p.m. But Kristen was found around 2 a.m., which is now May 25th, passed out drunk in a neighboring lawn to the fraternity house. Two fellow students leaving the party, Cheryl Anderson, and Tim Davis noticed Kristen and helped her up to her feet and headed back towards campus dorms. It wasn't long before another student caught up to them, eager to help. And his name is Paul Flores. The group made it back near the dorms, but Tim Davis lived off campus, so he departed the group of four first followed by Cheryl Anderson, next once she made it to Sierra Madre Hall. Paul Flores told Cheryl he would help Kristen back to her dorm since his was closer. Cheryl agreed and watched Paul Flores with his arms snug around Kristen's waist, holding her up. A girl not even able to walk on her own, fade off in the distance towards their dorms. Paul claims he walked Kristen as far as his dorm, Santa Lucia Hall, which wasn't far from Kristen's dorm, Murr Hall. He claims he allowed her to walk the rest of the way and that that was the last time she was seen. Leaving Paul Flores as the last person to see Kristen in what's now been a 25-year-old case. Paul Flores didn't have the best reputable reputation. But you'll have to wait until next time of Dig Up the Backyard to find out. Be sure to subscribe, share, and follow my social media to keep up with this case. I always appreciate Apple Podcast stars and reviews. I will be posting the campus and dormitory map to help you understand the layout of this crime. Tune in next week for episode number two. Until then, you know what to do. Stay weird, my friends. Oh, and one more thing. Hi, Mom.